No. We'll fine. Go. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the True Life Podcast. I hope everybody is having a beautiful day. I hope that the, the world is treating you like you want to be treated. And if it's not, well, I hope you understand that there's a test involved and that's just the way it is. You'll find a way to make the best of it. And uh, last night I was talking to a gentleman in Egypt. Today I'm talking to a gentleman over here in Lithuania. We're talking about psychedelics. We're talking about the way in which the world is changing. We're talking about journeys and we're going to cover a lot of ground. But let me just go ahead and introduce the incredible Ladislav Andreev. Fellow voyager of mind and spirit to our sanctuary of exploration and enlightenment. And uh, it's a it's a great honor and a distinct honor to be welcoming Vladislav, a visionary partner at Fanatic, whose journey through the realms of business strategy and sustainability has been nothing short of awe-inspiring. With over two decades of wisdom gleaned from the intricate dance of marketing, sales, and negotiation, Vladislav has been a guiding light for companies seeking not only profit, but also purpose. Through his mastery in developing and implementing brand strategies, he has woven a tapestry of success for diverse clients from industry giants like P&G and Ab Abinbev to innovative disruptors like Yandex and Boylan. Yet Vladislav's brilliance extends far beyond the boardroom. As the founder of One Species, he champions sustainability and excellence, reminding us of our sacred duty to nurture and preserve our planet. In the realm of conscious exploration, he leads the charge with an entheogenic renaissance, a bilingual platform dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of entheogens and their profound healing potential. Vladislav, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? Oh, I'm good, man. I'm so excited. And after you saying all those nice words about me, I didn't know how to behave. Uh, I mean, I melted pretty much. <laughs> I've never heard anything like that somebody talk about me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely excited to have this conversation. <laughs> thank you for bringing me here yeah the pleasure is all mine you know, maybe give people a little bit of a background so you and i are complete opposite sides of the world over here you maybe you could speak to a little bit about uh where you're at how you got there and uh, any kind of background you want to fill in sure happy to so i'm russian born and i as they as i say i was born in the crossroad pretty much between europe and asia in a city that is known for literally ending russian monarchy it's called the Ekaterinburg, and next to it, there is a border that literally separates Europe and Asia. So I know like both of the worlds, and uh, I've been living there at the outskirts of this industrial city for the majority of my life. And then I moved to Moscow. I worked in the corporate sector throughout my entire life. And my first foreign trip was at 19 years old when I went to U.S. for uh, work and travel. It was in Maine. And uh, I was amazed. I was blown away for months of summertime that literally changed my life. And ever since, I've never been the same again. And after that, yeah, I mean, in 2021, I uh, went to uh, like entrepreneurial direction, let's put it this way. And, you know, the war started in 2022 and uh, actually changed again everything that I knew. But yeah, there was a, an interesting moment, I guess. Can I like share for like another couple of minutes? Yeah, dude, as long as you want, man. This is fascinating. Please. <laughs> yeah, just you know, yeah. tell me to shut up from time to time Not at because all, man. My, my my thoughts they jump for here. I want to hear it. I I think it's like what they call nowadays like neurodivergent. But whenever yeah. you feel that I'm losing track, let's just you know steer back. <laughs> But anyway, so it was January 2022, and me and my wife, we bought tickets for uh, Istanbul. So we've been living in Moscow, and uh, we're together since six years ago. So um, we wanted to, you know, spend some time in Istanbul in a nice hotel in the mountains. So we found it, and it was supposed to have a jacuzzi in a fireplace. And uh, we bought tickets for February 22nd, 2022. And on February 26th, so if I remember correctly, we were supposed to come back. So on the 24th of February is the day when the war started, basically. We were supposed to enjoy ourselves in the jacuzzi and the fireplace. And uh, we go from the old part of Istanbul to the new part to pick a car and we go for a breakfast. And a friend of mine recommended a really nice place with the fantastic croissants. So we're ordering breakfast and the friend of mine writes me a message like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, what happened? She's like, Ukraine is no fly zone. I was like, what the fuck? And then immediately, you know, our life uh, just changes entire direction because, uh, I mean, we still take the car. 
we take the three hour dark drive of doom scrolling and then it's just doom scrolling in jacuzzi doom scrolling at the fireplace and trying to understand like what to do with our life and then accidentally a friend of mine an ex-colleague reached out and uh, with the help and then basically on 6th of march so the war started on february 24th and 6th of march i have like six days left in my visa in Schengen. And a friend of mine in Lithuania says, you know, there's a program that could try and help you relocate yeah. business from Russia. I was like, okay, I'm buying the tickets. And, you know, well, I'm a Russian citizen. I don't have any other passport or whatnot. So I arrive on 6th of March to uh, Poland. It's a connection flight to further go to Lithuania. And then, you know, Poland has its, you know, beef with Russia, let's put it this way. <laughs> so I'm there and, you know, the customs officer is looking at me at my passport and like asking me, like, where are you heading to? Like, uh, Russia. <laughs> He's like, do you have tickets? I'm like, no, <laughs> but I'm going to buy them. Uh, you know, it took him like 10 minutes. He called somebody, you know, yeah. browsed through my passport. It was intense. But luckily, I had the background, the negotiations, so, you know, that helped me kind of stay cool. But eventually, he let me in. And ever since, like, March 2022, uh, we're here. We, we got our dog here relocated from uh, Moscow. We took her from shelter during COVID. And we joke that she's the only family member that has European passport, unlike us. <laughs> So, yeah, we're thinking about, you know, marrying her and uh, reconcile with the family. <laughs> But yeah, other than that, yeah, so the topics of psychedelic, um, yeah, just a quick one here. So I've been familiar with psychedelics since like 20, 21 years ago or so. And uh, they've been an integral part of my life every now and then. They helped me a lot and they helped me heal my own traumas, uh, several of them by myself. And it was like self-learning experience of therapeutic approach, let's put it this way. But then... Um, uh, when the war started, I've been drinking a lot, like a lot, because, you know, it's, it's just hard yeah. to process, like move all the stuff, like change everything in your life. And, you know, took a while to recover. But then last year, a friend of mine told me that, you know, there's a TV show you should watch for Netflix, How to Change Your Mind. Mm. I was like, OK, let's check it out. It was in May last year. And I watched it like, fuck finally you can talk about it out loud i was like really like seriously is it uh, is it legal <laughs> and then you know i started to get into the wormhole i guess the rabbit's hole and eventually quickly realized that there's a psychedelic renaissance happening i was like oh my god i need to catch up so ever since pretty much i started to dig into the topic started to read medical publications uh, medical research articles listen to webinars podcasts and read books and gather as much data as possible in september there was this uh, program by university of california berkeley which is called psychedelics in the mind so I went through it in like three days and like, I need more, I need more. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, it just went on and on. But then at some point I realized that, you know, the amount of information about psychedelics in, in Russian in particular is extremely limited. Mm -hmm. And, you know, surprisingly enough, there are people from Russian background, like uh, Alexander Sasha Shulgin, for instance, child Huge. of Russian immigrants. There's another persona who is not widely recognized. Uh, unfortunately, uh, her name was Valentina Gherkin Vassan, spouse of Gordon Vassan. Mm -hmm. And actually, if it wasn't for her, Gordon wouldn't have went to Mexico in the first place. And the reason being is that, well, she was born in Moscow, by the way. Uh, her parents relocated her after the Russian Revolution. So she came to West, they got married, and then they went to Catskills in the U.S. for their honeymoon. And she noticed that there were peculiar mushrooms there that looked really familiar as if they were the ones that, you know, were growing in Moscow. But Gordon wasn't, you know, that fascinated about mushrooms. He actually kind of either not disgusted by them or like didn't like them, basically. But Valentina at some point came up with a theory that, you know, Slavic people are mycophilic. And mm -hmm. like Western or Anglo-Saxon, as she called them, and I was Russian propaganda calls it as well, are mycophobic. So Gordon was mycophobic, whereas she was mycophilic. And, you know, there is a lot about mushrooms in the Slavic cultures in the water time, especially. But anyway, she was the one convincing him, you know, that we should look into mushrooms and things like that. So she was the first woman to have a psilocybin mushroom trip. And she published an article in Life magazine, if I remember correctly, or maybe wrong here or Newsweek. 
But anyway, the magic mushrooms I had. So anyway, um, the funny thing here, or actually tragic, is that when you go to Wikipedia and you open like Valentino Vassan's page and you can find that page is in English, which, you know, makes sense. It's Wikipedia after all. It is a Spanish. Yeah, again, makes sense because Mexico, Maria Sabina and, you know, the magic mushrooms. It is in Arabic. I don't know why. I mean, like, seriously, <laughs> I have no clue. But the worst thing is that it does not exist in Russian language. Mm. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I should fix that. So I yeah. just started to, you know, blog about it. And there's this social network called Telegram. It's kind of similar to WhatsApp, but very different. It's from uh, the Russian interpreter who, so at some point in time, he just copy pasted Facebook and then, you know, sold it and then created this <laughs> masterpiece of uh, Messenger. But anyway, it's like a social network, so to speak. So I started there. But then a friend of mine in India convinced me to start a video blog as well. And I was like, ah, hell, why not? <laughs> so here I am. It's amazing. I'm glad. I'm glad that you are doing it. Well, maybe we could speak to this idea of, you know, shamanic culture, mycophilic. Is there like a shamanic culture in Russia? Like I know that there's a lot of history in Europe about mushrooms and you know, ceremonies and altered states of consciousness. But is there something unique to Russia that, that maybe people should know about? Yeah, there are some things, of course. And uh, first and foremost, the word shaman, if you go to the origins, it is Russian root. Uh -huh. And there aren't uh -huh. many le uh, words in English language that have Russian roots. So like... Um, Shit, was it Sputnik at some point in time got replaced by satellite, <laughs> Pagrom, uh, and uh, there was another one that I missed. But anyway, shaman is uh, Russian. Uh, well, can, I don't know, like some of the variations of Russian languages because there are many of them. It's not like only Russian in Russia. There are other like ethnicities who indigenous cultures basically and their languages that are being pretty much destroyed nowadays. But anyway, so if you go further to the east, of course, there is a shamanic culture. And, uh, you know, there are shamans that live in Altai region, which is pretty much close to Everest and, you know, all the heights mm -hmm. and all the mountains there. But generally speaking, on the country's level, they say that, you know, even the president has his own shaman and some other, like, you know, healers or whatnot, yeah. some mystics uh, here yeah. and there, even in the Russian CIA and something like that. But, of course, it's, like, unofficial. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the culture is there. The legacy is there. But it, it's not, like, present and visible. But it is quite common to, you know, know a kind of shaman or, like, a healer or something yeah. like that. And they are in the culture. But in the majority of cases, the shamanic, um, like, like, people and rituals are conducted with the help of Amanita Muscaria, to the best of my knowledge, mm. which is not prohibited in, in Russia, unlike all the other psychedelics and drugs, pretty much. So Russia is, like, totally on the war on drugs path. Still, I mean, they, they don't give a shit about the progress. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if I'll answer your questions. I guess you can find shamans nowadays. But yeah, not that common. Although very popular Russian singer that's being used by the propaganda machine is a uh, kind of nickname is shaman. Hmm. So I guess they're playing this aspect. Oh, yeah. And funny thing, I remember there was this uh, anti-narcotics policy in Russia. Uh, I think they've accepted like four or five years ago. So they're trying to um, bring people to traditional values, so-called. Okay. Mm. So I try to understand like, what are those traditional values? So shamanism is a traditional value of Russian society because, you know, shaman is said it yeah. comes from Russia and it's part of the culture. But then again, if you go on the Wikipedia page and then look at closely at the description of what shaman does is that typically that person is using entheogens. Yeah. So, I mean, this is value the culture, why you're not using it. <laughs> you should be. But yeah, they're totally prohibited. It's fascinating to me. I go when I when I read a little bit about some of the Russian culture or the Eastern cultures, the Eastern Orthodox, it has like this really rich history with mysticism. And like mm. through mis when I think of mysticism, I think of a religious experience. And when I think of that, 
like that's what happens to me like on a really deep psychedelic trip is like there's this connection to something greater than me which is mystic in a way whatever word you want to use to describe it there is this connection to something bigger than we understand it's this ineffable and i i think that there's i, I i'm hopeful that not only will our relationship continue to blossom, but so too will the investigation into Eastern mysticism, particularly Russian in that area. I think it's a really rich area that has a lot of knowledge that in the world of psychedelics, we should become more familiar with, man. What do you think? Yeah, yeah th that's totally true. There's, there's only one problem is with the religion aspect is that okay. in the majority of places in Russia, the kind of dominant religion is uh, Russian Orthodox. Okay. And it, in my view, it is probably one of the worst religions thus far because it tells people to suffer and to accept it mm -hmm. and do nothing about it. So it has nothing to do with the mystical uh, experience of psychedelics at all. People just go there to, you know, like pray for something that, <laughs> you know, I don't even understand what. But if we go towards a more ancient direction, so-called, because prior to... Uh, uh, orthodox there were other religions like you know the, you, the greeks had their own religion yeah. figures and russian of course right. had own like uh, gods of thunder for instance like sun you know and their animism yeah. and one of the oldest idols uh, found on the planet uh was like eleven thousand years old it was actually next to the city that i was born at it was found in some swamps and it's like a, it's called Shigir Idol. So if you Google it, uh, you can find it. I think it's 11,000 years old. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, the religious aspect is there. The mystical aspect is there. But currently, it has no place in the society at all because of many, many reasons. And, of course, Soviet Union uh, kind of played it, its part, naturally. But, yeah, nowadays, it's just too far from reality, which is a shame. Yeah. it's Sometimes I wonder, you know, and I, I wonder if these wave of psychedelic renaissance that seem to make their way into society. They seem to usher in a transitional phase. Like there's so much change that comes with these times. And just like the last wave of psychedelics, where we saw an explosion of creativity, we saw this outbreak of violence and just times are changing. And it seems that we are in an echo of that again today. And isn't it interesting that we're beginning to see this new emergence or this re-emergence of the psychedelic experience? I wonder, are those things connected? Do you think it's somehow like in theogens are the planet talking to us and creating change agents? Man, I do hope so because <laughs> otherwise I just, I don't get it. Like, like seriously, <laughs> it's, it's about time because uh, humanity is just killing itself. Like literally uh, shooting itself in the, in the leg, then in the hand at some point, it'll eventually in yep. either heart or head, but you know, like consuming all the fossil fuels and over consuming of everything basically. So if the Ugins are there to help us realize that, and I have, I did this, the, there was this study done by two uh, Swedish researchers, and I I made a post about it on LinkedIn. It, it's somewhere there um, under Enthiogenic Renaissance. So they created a, uh, they did, did a meta study of the kind of connected uh, of correlation between the mystical experience uh, that, you know, is people are having when they're consuming high doses of psychedelics and the connectedness with nature and oneness. And the, as a result, more like conscious decisions, environmentally friendly and more sustainable in the long run. And I mean, long story short, for pretty much all people who consume psychedelics, I think it is obvious, right? But then again, when you read it in a nice research publication, you can find it very promising because ideally if you know all the people uh who run big corporations have this therapeutic like proper therapeutic approach with psychedelics they could 
change a lot in terms of how they do like make decisions within their business like what their business does whether or not you know they pollute mother nature or create a new product that's gonna be destroying it for just profit and things like this and i have a strong belief that you know once those people are introduced with the therapeutic potential of psychedelics they're not going to be making stupid decisions that would be in you know they their own favor or the shareholders favor or the short-term gain and just kill the entire ecosystem pretty much what was this name al hubbard if i remember correctly you, you that there was this guy uh, the second wave of psychedelic uh, emergence he was a canadian i don't know mobster or something like mm. that uh, so he was involved with um yeah, Humphrey Osman as well at some mm. point in time. So he had these like strange ideas that you know once you get all the CEOs on LSD, yeah. <laughs> they will change the world. So I think I kind of share that thinking in a sense, but of course right. not in not that manic way. But then again, you know, with the emergence of psychedelics from a different perspective, like not only healing but also coaching. You know, it gives you a different perspective because people who are high in the organizations, they're either burnt out, they lost their purpose, they lost the meaning of life and things like this. And once they get introduced to psychedelics, things can change for better. Yeah, that's really well said. And I agree. I, I think if Leary was around today, it would be a <laughs> different conversation, you know, like there'd be a lot more people that were were receptive you know and i recently went went back and i watched the buckley uh the william f buckley versus leary debate and like it, it's just so interesting to oh. see both sides of this really conservative view and then this other view and to see where we're at today and i i echo your sentiments about the world of business and you know i, I do think that if we can begin and, and maybe it's an age thing you know maybe hmm. Maybe it is, you know, maybe these things are connected. If you look at the drugs on which the boomer generation ran, it's <laughs> primarily alcohol, which is, yeah. a, you know, it's, it's, it's a worst. horrible drug. It's a it's horrible the worst. drug. It just kills your spirit. It kills yeah. everything about you. It yeah. deadens you to the reality of that you are a part of nature. It's, sep it's so separating and isolating. And then all of a sudden you have this new wave of entheogens or psychedelics that are like, you have this new perspective. You're like, wait a minute, I'm going to destroy nature. I am nature. That's like punching yeah, exactly. myself in the face. Like that's so dumb. Why don't I treat the people that work underneath me as part of me? Like, why don't we work together? Like, and so maybe this next wave, much like a psychedelic trip, each mm. wave gets stronger until you hit the peak. Maybe this wave of psychedelics is this one where we're, we're beginning to be like, oh shit, here it comes. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it's starting to come on pretty strong right now. <laughs> yeah, man, I hear you. That resonates strongly. And I do hope that happens. The only thing that puzzles me is that if you look at the current psychedelic renaissance and everything right. that is happening, actually, it is pretty much ex-British colonies. Mm. Right? I mean, I don't know. At some point in time, I had this epiphany. Okay. Like, well, US, right? I mean, Canada, Australia, first country in the world to, you know, start psychedelic assistance therapy in the first yeah. place. Uh, South Africa, not so much, but they're producing. You know, I mean, not India, definitely. <laughs> they, right. They're not that strong. But, you know, it's just uh, what I'm saying here is that out of, let's say, other part of the world, like Eastern Hemisphere or, you know, Southeast Asia, for instance, there is like totally different sentiment there. Like, you know, Federico Duterte from Philippines, <laughs> like uh, Sri Lanka's struggle and their continuous war on drugs and, you know, all the limitations in India. Ah, it's just nothing's happening there. And, you know, it looks thus far that it's just only like one big superpower of us and you know the acolytes of united kingdom so to speak and and that's it and the rest of the world's like what we, what are psychedelics <laughs> never heard of them like let's pray to them <laughs> but yeah. of course there are the countries that are like forward thinking like portugal who legalized yeah. uh, all drugs like you can consume no problem at all and they have a decrease in numbers for heroin users like four times that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. My my hope is that it's a Trojan horse. You know, I think a <laughs> lot of people in positions of authority have taken the 
the Huxley view of psychedelics as a disassociative, and they can be like they mm. could be the soma in Brave New World, where people take it and they feel happy about their imprisonment. Yeah. But I think that's the Trojan horse. I, I think what's going to happen, and and I see it happen in the U.S. is like you see these, you know, pharmaceutical companies like, listen, let's just give these people their damn soma and let them be happy about this. But all of a sudden, you're seeing this rattling the cage of the medical environment like let me out of here hmm. you know and it's escaping out of that medical container and they can't control it and i i think it's to a point will it will it will get to a point where it escapes the medical container not only through the cage but through the people facilitating the medical exploration of it like you're seeing at least in the u.s i'm seeing you know doctors being questioned like oh so you're going to provide psychedelic therapy have you ever done psychedelics and the doctor's like, nope. Oh. It's like, well, why should why should I listen to you then? Yeah. You know, when you're seeing maybe someone who's been on the underground without a medical degree, who may have been a veteran, that's worked through their own PTSD or worked through the death of their child or worked through their alcoholism. Now, this person on some level is being treated as the expert that the doctor thinks that they should be. You know, maybe mm. we need both. I get both, but like I'm seeing that sort of escaping the medical container like hey maybe mm. we don't maybe these people that we're calling experts and professionals while well, they are on some level maybe this other person who's been a 25 year person who's worked at the bottom of an amazon company maybe that's the expert maybe that yeah. person has some ideas about how to really get through tragedy you know and but that's what i see i see it as a trojan horse on some level is that too far out there listen i think you're onto something here yes. because um i i can <laughs> tell from my own experience so you've touched several topics that resonated strongly so first of all is alcohol and as yeah. said, alcohol is the worst drug in the world and even worse than heroin and uh, my father was an alcoholic my grandfather was an alcoholic and i seen them drinking themselves to death so at 12 uh, when i was 12 a country went kaput in terms of their economy in 1998 the economy meltdown so my father lost job and for the next five years he's been just drinking basically and i'd seen it's it's awful and you know he died eventually out of a heart attack if i remember correctly six months after his father died because as well he just followed him to the grave so um when i got into the topic of the psychedelics and i started to understand like uh, maybe i can get like proper education so i found like a couple of institutions so to speak where they have like either a master's degree or something around the psychedelics or psychedelic therapy or psychedelic coaching and then i applied there of course they didn't accept me because i don't have any medical background <laughs> because i'm not a clinician because i'm not right. a psychiatrist right so yeah they did let me in which you know kind of makes sense and but i would argue because you know they had this point which says like uh, e uh, interventions and in behavior and I, I am thinking to myself, so for the duration of three years, I've been working for British negotiation consultancy and conducting behavioral change workshops. Yep. Yep. So, of course, you can say it's totally different because I've been telling people how to change their behavior in specific contexts of negotiation. But I've been doing that for like thousands of hours. Yeah. Yeah. So technically I'm fit. But, you know, the funny thing is that the rules and the constructs are there that you know the limit from entering and then one moment i have this epiphany is that pretty much you know you remember the, the stone ape theory right so yeah, I, I mean everything is a social construct pretty yeah. much and then yeah. you look at those rules and you think like so just explain it to me if there is a person who got a diploma is that person is like totally qualified or not and i remember seeing a person on linkedin who was like psychiatrist like clinician and something like that diploma here diploma there and then she says that vaccines are killing people i'm like who the fuck gave you diploma <laughs> like seriously <laughs> So what I'm saying here is that I, I guess the GD is out of the bottle. Uh, that, that's what I said before we start recording, but you're, you're onto something here because, you know, all the clinicians, they may have the knowledge of the therapy and the approach, but if they don't know how psychedelics work, it's just not going to fly. But there are a lot of shamans and underground like gurus and facilitators. Yeah. The problem is they're, of course, not either licensed, but license means shit literally yeah. nothing it always depends on the personality and there's been cases with maps with the, yeah. the scandals here the scandals there it, it doesn't mean that the person who has a diploma is the 
proper per person to conduct either therapy or be ethically like i don't know strong in their commitment to heal other human beings so what i'm saying here is that uh i guess it's just very important to understand like who is this person to whom you're entrusting your psyche whenever yeah. you are using psychedelics pretty much yeah it's such the gray area and I, I, that's one of the big issues that i see in places like denver or oregon or kentucky that's working with iboga now it's it's these places are trying to figure it out and, and in doing so and in trying to figure this out it shines a giant light on this concept of when the instrument becomes the institutionalized it mm -hmm. begins to lose its edge <clears throat> you know what i mean by that like like psychedelics work we know they do but when you begin to institutionalize them and build a diploma around them and build all these people around them like it starts to lose its effectiveness you know and and mm -hmm. it, that's i i understand the need for safety i get it i understand the need to make sure that the people that are applying the therapy have their, your best interest in mind and they want to be trusted. Like you don't need, you don't want to have another, you know, Jim Jones or Charles Manson or something like that. But at the same time, at what point in time does the inflow of money become more about creating profit and the institution than it does mm -hmm. about the health, you know? And, and that that's not just psychedelics, that's everything. That's yeah. one reason I love psychedelics because it shows you that. It's like, hmm. hey, look at this whole thing. It's all like that. It's all a construct. <laughs> yeah. It's new knowledge on the same information. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I, I think that that's on some level, when you look back at the 60s, that's why they were banned. Like hmm. on some level, psychedelics opens your eyes to the idea of this is all bullshit. Yeah. All of it. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. I think this is the, the, one of the reasons they're prohibited in Russia because people would recognize quite yeah. soon enough that the king is naked. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think yeah, the problem is that, you know, the capitalist society, you know, however you call it, but it has yeah. its like ups and downs or advantages and disadvantages, I guess. One of the advantages that increases the level of like quality of life and everything. But the disadvantage is that the pursuit for profit, yeah, actually it harms in the long run. And if you, I, I don't know if you had stumbled upon a book called The Emperor Wears No Clothes. I don't remember the the author so the guy it was like some u.s guy in the 80s he created a book that was basically a compilation of all the historical data about weed and the cannabis in the human history from like encyclopedia yeah. britannica and other factual sources he puts it all together and basically he says that you know uh the ham got prohibited because dupont invented nylon from yep. you know dinosaurs and million old trees and then they wanted to make profit and how do you make profit if everything's made out of hemp prohibit hemp <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> make profit sure. so what are you saying is that of course it's losing its age and, and, and whenever you know we're talking about therapy i really find it hard to imagine to have like you know an a proper like lsd or psilocybin experience within like white walls and mm -hmm. you know the hospital facility i was like I, I think it can like lead to very tough trip but of course it, it's not like this everywhere but because it is somewhat unregulated and you know yeah. the genie is out of the bottle there are cases where I, I i've read an article about like some ketamine clinic in the us in the mall where you just get in <laughs> they give you ketamine and there's nobody in the room and you're just lying there with the ketamine ingested in your veins and tripping like what the fuck is this <laughs> <laughs> this is just too much you know the mcdonald's of transformation yeah, the, <laughs> but that's awful. That's awful. That caused harm. And actually, you know, that can backfire because, you know, people go there, they experience hard emotions, they cannot deal with them, they reopen their trauma, and then they, I don't know, either just commit suicide or do some st stupid shit. And then they start to question, like, why did they do this? Oh, they went to a ketamine clinic, mm -hmm. like Matthew Perry last yeah. year. They went to yep. Switzerland, $150,000 for a ketamine treatment, like seriously. And then he decides to have a ketamine on him all with in the pool, at a pool and just it drowns. Like that's what happens when you don't teach people safety. That's yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah, ironically enough, like I was an alcoholic for a long time. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I think that we're so quick to, and, and probably out of love, probably out of kindness, 
we're so quick to blame a substance for someone's yeah. departure rather than we are the the problems that underlie that symptom, right? Like that's these totally are symptoms, true, man. man. Absolutely, I, I cannot agree more. It's like you know, blaming the guns. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah that's an evil gun. It's an evil yeah. one. Yeah, it kills. <laughs> But that nobody, nobody even tries to address the the reality in which people live, the reality, the stigma, the taboo right. that surrounds them. And right. when whenever you kind of consume, it creates additional problems. It creates additional issues. I mean, if you get hospitalized, you cannot even talk about it out loud because it's prohibited. Because I mean, they're going to arrest you for consuming, and this is ridiculous. So that stigma definitely needs to go for the harm reduction to happen. I guess that's what I'm doing in my podcast. You are, so, definitely. Trying to, you know, give the knowledge to people because uh, even though psychedelics are safe, like extremely safe, people can do stupid shit. And, you know, that French student that died in yeah. Amsterdam and the reason they prohibited psilocybin mushrooms, not like truffles, is just, you know, no precaution measures. That dude didn't have a trip sitter, no set and setting, just went on walking around the city and decided to that's the gravity, I guess. But uh, still, you know, people do stupid shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I go back and forth, like on some level, you know, especially after like some deep trips, man, where I just, you know, leave this planet on some level, you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm calling my mom and my sister at like 3.30 in the morning. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm an alien, you know? <laughs> like shut the fuck up dude go to bed <laughs> you know and i'm like no you guys don't get it like i'm talking to the aliens right now yeah. you're an alien too you don't get it you know like so on some level i'm like okay this can be something that makes people maybe obviously it's not for everybody maybe it should yeah, be restricted sure. to some people but you know who am i to say someone else can't do it like when i and when i start going down that road it, it does get kind of slippery on some level i well, there are there are some things that we should definitely remember. Like okay. you know, if a person or their first bloodline relative have schizophrenia or yeah. bipolar disease or predisposition, I would definitely advise them to avoid psychedelics because they. Why can... though? Like, what, is there because of the literature that says that that or like what what is the real evidence behind that? So technically, there is evidence. Uh, I mean, if you can, if you look at the data. So the idea there is not that they create schizophrenia or bipolar disease, but mm -hmm. it's that they kind of fast uh, speed up the processes, basically. Mm. So if a person have a predisposition, it may or may not, let's say, convert into full, full blown yeah. schizophrenia, bipolar disease in the I don't know next few years or ten years or decades. But the psychedelics can speed things up if you know there is no preparation no set and setting and you know it can open a deep trauma for instance and people won't be able to deal with it by themselves so th those things are still like cautionary measures and ideally i wouldn't advise to you know people with like i, I don't want to call it like weak psyche but like the problems that are not addressed through therapy like yeah. i don't know traumas especially to mm -hmm. consume psychedelics by themselves because they may end up creating problems for themselves i mean they can theoretically heal themselves but without the proper trip sitter or you know like a shaman a guru or a therapist yeah. or a coach or whomever nearby who can really help and create the container and you know facilitate the healing process it may really create additional harm for human psyche. So what I'm saying here, yeah. and, as, and I've looked at the data, I try to like address properly like all those claims that you know psychedelic cause yeah, schizophrenia. They don't. Right. They speed up the processes. That's it. They're like you, you know, there's this phrase: they're meaning enhancers, but they're enhancing. So the enhancing quality is there, and because it is psyche, because it's deep rooted in like uh, subconscious and the genes it just you know sparks up a disease pretty much so that's the thing so for that reason i wouldn't advise people with yeah schizophrenia or bipolar disease or you know if they have first bloodline relatives to consume psychedelics yeah. and probably not if they're on ssris and mao uh yeah. antidepressants as well because some substances can lead to even like fatal combinations so better to avoid yeah, those are great points. I, I'm hopeful in the future. Like, I was talking to Alexander Ledbedev, 
who's out mm -hmm. of Norway, amazing individual. I, I should, Russian I guy. Should, oh, he's epic. I, I'll, I'll introduce you guys. Like you guys would get along great. He's a yeah, super smart guy. Be delighted he's, too. he's one of us. He's one of us. And, uh, you know, we were talking about what's happening inside the brain during like, a really high dose trip. And mm. there's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of feedback and there's a lot of speculation. I spoke with Brian Roth who, who spoke about, you know, all this money that they've done for funding, looking at the 5-H2A receptor. But when you really start, when you really pull the curtain mm. back, we don't know that much, man. We spent That's millions, true. maybe billions of dollars. And like still with all this much. <laughs> They're like, it's kind of bullshit, man. Like, it, it kind of makes me yeah. laugh in some way. Like, Jesus, we spent how much money? You guys don't know shit. You don't know <laughs> shit about it, man. You know, and, and so that, that's where, like, I come from a family that my like, my dad is bipolar. Mm. And I kind of think on some level, there's there has to be boundaries. And I understand a clinical setting for someone who may have some sort of cognitive impairment. But mm. possibly psychedelics could be the answer for that. You know, if you look back to the way psychedelics were used back in the day, it used to be that a professional would take them so they could thoroughly understand what it's like to be in a psychotic state. And I think that yeah. there's real, I think that there's real juju there, man. I think there's <laughs> real juju. I think there's real stuff there that like <laughs> makes you feel like, oh my God, this is what it's like to be in a state in another reality. And then once you begin to understand that, maybe you could have some empathy for someone who's going through these episodes on some level, right? Absolutely. And uh, if I remember correctly, prior to all this Huxley and Humphrey Osmer nailing the psychedelic in the first place, it was called the substances were called psychotic mimetic, mimicking yes. psychosis. So, of course, there you go, but understanding what it's like to have a full-blown psychosis. And I know, I remember, like, I've had those trips yeah. where I felt like yeah. I'm losing it. I'm just, I'm going to be like a mental <laughs> institution, like, member for the rest of my life. That's it. Bye-bye. I'm not going to come back. And I had those moments. <laughs> they were fucking scary, I tell you. Yeah. Can you share one of those moments with us? Oh, man. It was so, yeah, we went to a festival. I think it was Spongel. Uh, or, yeah, yeah, it was Perfect. Spongel in Moscow. And yeah. uh, we went, the three of us, uh, from a different city. And fortunately, we weren't prepared for the weather. So we went there. And, uh, you know, we, so one of, I think it was like either two C B or something like that. So it was not like LSD or something. We weren't sure. I mean, you kind of test it. You just, you know, trust whatever <laughs> somebody <laughs> supplies you. And then uh, we went there, and the, one of the guys, or three of us, he had like kind of seizure pretty much at some point in time. So I had to run for an ambulance and, you know, bring the ambulance brigade to him. And then eventually it was all good. But then we had to go to like a hospital or something. And then, you know, it started to kick in. And then I, I lost it. I thought that that's it. They're taking me here to just put me in the mental hospital. I'm going to stay there for the rest of my life. But of course, as with all the trips uh, with psychedelics, it all passes away <laughs> after some time. <laughs> And you become normal or, you know, never become normal pretty much, but still, you know, kind of. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome, man. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I, I think that's important. I, I think that I, I know one time for me, I had taken like 18 grams of mushrooms. I'm like, I'm going to go deep. I took Ooh. this 18 gram dose. And what I've learned on that dose, Adam, Adam Tapp and I were talking about this. It seems to me, at least on psilocybin, on these really higher dosages, that there's like a double peak. On mm. some level, there's like a breakthrough, and then things get foggy. And you're like, Phew. I can't remember thing. But then there's another peak of clarity. Mm. And I remember on the second peak, like, I, I, I just got like so biblical and started thinking, like, oh yeah, I get it, you know. And it, and it just made sense to me, like, yeah, now I get it. Yeah, like, and, and it, and when I look back on it, like, there's this clarity, like Jesus is an alien, like all this stuff that was probably in my mind already, but. I was in a different world and I can remember it like, oh my God, it's so clear. This is the truth. Without a doubt, this is the truth. And it was so clear and so pristine. But then when I came back down, I'm like, I was fucking crazy. That's not true, you know? But <laughs> to see it with so much clarity. Yeah, I know. It's really something you can look back on and be like, oh my God, how it's, it gives you a different perspective of, of, different mental True. states and what is possible and, and empathy with people. And like, it's, 
it, it's so helpful if you can get through it on some level. Yeah, man, I totally resonates. I remember having those moments and the deepness exactly as you yeah. described them. And this is one of the very fascinating qualities of psychedelics is that, yes. you know, I mean, you are on the other part of the world. We've never seen each other before in our entire life. And yet we have this same profound right. experience. Right. And this is like insane. And yeah. we're all like part of this bigger no sphere, I guess, the yep. global subconscious or however you call it. But I remember those moments. And I, I remember, I think it was like, like maybe 18 years ago or so when I had one of those moments, you know, the breakthrough moment that yep. you just described. Yeah. And then I realized that, oh, I understand now. Now I get it. And then I had this thought right there, right, right at that particular moment is that, okay, it is important that I understand right now, but will I remember it tomorrow? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, you know, typically it evaporates, but integration, uh, as far as I've learned, it, it's of course critical and important. As yeah. Well. It, regardless if you this is just a theory and I this none of this this could all be bullshit but this is just what I think about sometimes. I think that those breakthrough moments and the very difficult part of our trips are the mm -hmm. manifestation of neuroplasticity in real time. Like that's your brain rewiring itself in real time. That's why you're freaking yeah. out. It's like boom, your brain is creating new neural pathways. Like mm -hmm. and, and like even if you don't remember exactly what happened when you were freaking out or when you had that breakthrough clarity, I think that after that event, you've created new pathways that allow creativity or thoughts to flow in a way that they haven't flown before. And that, that's where the real teaching can begin to come in. Like, hey, you know what? How come you know, people should be better at math? Not everybody learns the same way. Can we find a way to teach music through math? Like, you know, and that's kind of what mm. was happening in the 60s was these new ways of learning. These people were taking, you know, why not? Like, why does it have to be this standardized bubble? Like, what about this other stuff? And, like, I think that that's what psychedelics on some level are doing is they're providing new pathways the same way new neural pathways are being connected. Like, what about this way to learn? What about that way to learn? Is that too crazy? What do you think? I, I think you're into something here as well, man. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that true. makes sense. I mean, I haven't thought about it, and to me, it sounds like like new idea totally. But then, you know, I'm trying to recollect from the knowledge that I've gathered so far, and it it, it does make sense because when you're in psychedelics, they kind of the patterns of like regular connectivity within the brain and the neural networks that are disrupted and all the the new patterns are being created so hence neuroplasticity so when all parts of the brains are activated at some point at, at the same moment uh, it creates i think pretty much like the beginning of a new neural circuit in a sense yeah. and if you are like concentrating properly enough on like trying to memorize it and kind of calcify it, I guess you can then take it to your regular life with you. Yeah. At least the residuals of it. You know what I mean? Uh, like true. it's, it's like putting these on like a new set of lenses. Oh, like that's a, that's a new color. And I yeah. never noticed that. Maybe it's not, but you've never noticed it before. And then you notice that color everywhere. It's that, that gives me hope. Like that gives me hope that this first phase of this psych or this, this, I think there's layers to the psychedelic renaissance. And I think that the first layer is getting through our trauma. It's moving through mm. the PTSD. It's moving through these new things. But, you know, if you look close to the edges, you can see this creative cycle or this new movement happening, man. And like, I'm so excited for it. Like, <laughs> just me and you never knowing each other and talking to people on the opposite side, like you said, talking opposite sides of the world, having these experiences, people from everywhere could be listening we could be influencing people right now that we don't even know of man yeah it's, it's mind-blowing it is mind-blowing the, the only thing about the psychedelics is that you know whenever we're talking about when we're talking about higher levels of the uh, like muscles pyramid of hierarchy of needs right yeah yeah but i mean the entire like world is totally different and it recently came from sri lanka and india and you mm. know it's totally different lifestyle there of course and you know india is like okay. number one in terms of population and have a lot of issues there and of course other countries as well so, so psychedelics can help with solving a lot of them as well as you know helping treat like multi-generational wounds between cultures and if mm. i remember correctly prior to the escalation of the conflict between israel and palestine there was a study uh, 
for like use of ayahuasca for both like groups from yeah. Palestine and Israel. And it showed promise because people were willing to let go, you know, all the grudges, all the like uh, trauma from all the generations that were happening there, sitting there and basically driving their behavior and they were willing to let it go. So in my view, you know, creativity is all in nice for US for sure, but the rest of the world is not yet there. I mean, yeah. there are so many problems out there. I mean, all the wars and people make stupid decisions yeah. to kill people. I mean, I, yeah. I just I, I just don't get it. Like, seriously, this is like the most valuable, yeah. I don't know, aspect or how you call it, like life. <laughs> it is the most valuable thing that can ever be. And then people decide to kill each other. And there's like, are you fucking stupid? Like this stupid? <laughs> like, yeah. what's wrong with you? yeah i don't get it i don't either i, I it, it it breaks my heart on some level and it breaks my heart to think that i'm funding it on some level like my money yeah. my tax paying money is going right now for m murdering children and women like it, m me i'm yeah. responsible for that on some level and like dude, it makes me want to cry i'm like jesus how, how do i what do i do how do i stop mm. that you know and i I, I, Go live in the jungle, I guess, the only yeah. answer <laughs> on self-sufficiency, you know, solar batteries, like your yeah. own garden. Even then, though, like you, you're just, it's just a cop out. Like maybe this, maybe having conversations with people as insignificant as it may be, like maybe, you know, maybe it's the conversation of of inspiring someone to go within mm. and figure out why they hate something. Maybe, maybe that's how this works. It's like you figure out how you become the best version of yourself and that's how the mm. world changes. You know, I, that's, yeah. I hope, I don't know, but we are, we're, we are at, a, I think we're at a turning point where we got to decide and, and mm. everybody has to decide for themselves. Which side do you want to be on? You want to be on the side of life? Or you want to be on the side of death? Like which, which side are you going to be on and what are you going to do about it? It could be something as simple as like, you know what? I'm going to tell everybody in my life I love them. That could be it. That could be the thing you do to make the world better, right? Yeah. Maybe. Why not, man? <laughs> True. I fully agree with you because, you know, it's time to change something. And, yeah. you know, we should be the ones driving this change. Yes. Nobody's going to do it for us. Yep. So unless we yep. take the first step, there's not going to be a second step even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, totally. People are messed up. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I I see it changing. You know, um, there's a great book called The Fourth Turning, and in that book, mm. they talk about the way in which the generations. Have you have you heard about that book? No. Oh, it's great. It I might have a copy I can send you, but it's oh, it speaks to the good. idea of generational cycles. And okay. um, if you look at like every hundred years, there seems to be this thing we bump up against. You know, mm. the world wars and. Yeah. Just the, the disintegration of the idea of money or international finance versus national finance. Like these mm. things just come to a loggerheads at some point in time. And so, yeah, I, I, I think on some level that we need more people to, to not only experiment with psychedelics, but experiment mm. with what, what is possible in their lives. And I don't know what, you know, I think that there's a move towards sort of therapy as a, bio psycho social spiritual model that's a mouthful of oh, words that's but interesting <laughs> what do you think about that is that too crazy uh, no i you know there is something to it for sure uh, and you know the, the, i think the biggest problem with psychedelics is that it happened like previously in like mid of 20th century and it's still happening here and there is that there are pretty much like two con uh, like uh, protocols of consumption. Okay. So the, the therapeutic protocol and the recreational protocol, they're all totally different. Right. So whenever we're talking about psychedelics, of course, a lot of people are consuming them without the intent to heal their own trauma, right? <laughs> With an intention to have a good time, to party, to, I don't know, enjoy yeah. something, experiment, I guess, and try something new, or maybe they're cornered or peer pressure is there and they're like, oh, okay, you're trying it, why not? I'll do it as well. So other reasons, of course, are there. And the the thing about them is that you know not all people experience them in like proper way i'd say because if you look at like the history of relationships between humans and psychedelics it was always the ritual consumption it was not like 
there you go mushrooms for all you know it's not yeah. like this like they kick you on in greece like every like what was it like three or four years they've been mm -hmm. conducting those ceremonies yeah and you know in latin america and south america as well it was ritual and there were shamans and over yeah. here and there so whenever we were talking about democratizing access and you know providing it to all we definitely need to make sure that people treat them like accordingly because i mean you still can get like a worst night of your life and yes. then you know never touch psychedelics ever and think that it's the devil's doing pretty much and then tell everybody that they make people crazy and you should prohibit them but if they do it like in a stupid way so i guess what, what you're saying here to me resonates in the fact that we definitely need to, to teach people about like how to properly use them because mm -hmm. it's not it's not a kind of coke you know i mean you cannot just <laughs> occasionally take like 250 micrograms of lsd and you know hope that it's just gonna pass i mean seriously <laughs> it's not gonna work that way right <laughs> But yeah, teaching people is important in my view. You know, you have a unique background in negotiations and language. Now, obviously, you speak multiple languages. No, and only I, two. I just Russian language. I just tried to learn Spanish. It didn't work, unfortunately. But still, though, you have two lenses through which to see the world. If you can, if you speak both English and and Russian, it's like you have two different perspectives to conjugate the actions of the world on some level. And I'm curious, like, what do you think that? psychedelics have helped your relationship with language um oh that's an interesting question i never thought about it i, I think could be i mean uh, hard to say i never really really like put my thinking into it uh but in, in some cases i guess it made me kind of realize that you know i understand things without like translating them <laughs> properly yeah. because there are both words and phrases in each of the languages that cannot be translated properly right. and then you just understand them you understand the meaning but if you like stick to all thinking of i need to translate this and then kind of put it in my like structure of the right. language that i possess you're then trying to you know implement some rules that just don't fit yeah. whereas psychedelics uh, i think they create this general acceptance of something new and give the ability for brain to you know not try and fit everything within a certain box so to speak yeah i don't know if that makes sense yeah it does i you know the reason i ask is that sometimes in a psychedelic journey you know, it's, it's difficult to bring things back. There's no linguistic pathway to do it. So you bump up against something meaningful that you mm. can't describe. And that sounds True. a lot like what you're talking about. Like, you know, in German, they have schadenfreude. Like you feel mm. happy when something bad happens. We don't have that particular term in English, but now right. that you know about it, you can, you can comprehend it. It's sort of, it's, you know, it, it's not exactly there but it's it's similar it's the ineffable is mm. something meaningful you can't explain but learning other languages allows you to see the world in different ways it's Absolutely. It's, it's 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 fascinating to think about right uh that's true and you know the fact that there are so many languages out there yeah. this is like insane and it's just yep. not possible to learn them all so in a sense i mean you're lucky you don't need to learn other languages because the entire world speaks english pretty well I mean, not all of it, of course, but, you know, in the majority of cases. Uh, but nowadays, with all the technologies, it's just not a problem. You know, whenever I see people like uh, my countrymates traveling all over the world, not uh, speaking a single word in English and trying to shout in Russian to a foreigner <laughs> and, and trying to understand, like, why they're not understanding them. They're shouting, like, loudly. But, you know, still they somehow survive and they use the translation tools and everything. But, of course, it might be best to learn the language if possible. Unfortunately, I'm not that capable. Yeah, it's fascinating to, to think about all the different languages and, and how we can see the world through through those different ways. You're doing some stuff in India too. What maybe mm. you could speak about some of the pro the projects you have going on down there. It sounds like a pretty awesome one. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So there are like many reasons why I'm uh, related and connected with India. So yeah. first and foremost, the 12 years ago was the first time I went to India and I went to Vipassana meditation, which is a 10 day uh, meditation. Well, theorized that it was created by Gautama the Buddha. 
and it was like given in exact instructions from one person to another for the duration of past 2500 years so i went there it was a cultural shock by default but then surprisingly enough on my way back i um i stopped at uh at some guy's uh, place through couch surfing and that person became my best friend for life like seriously i literally recently saw him like a week ago he's got a child a newborn and you know i mean i'm on part of his business pretty much but uh because of the war and all the sanctions and everything that happened you know the western world let's say canceled russian russians and being a russian uh, passport holder nowadays is like a burden pretty much but india has a different um, kind of relationship with russia and you know they remember the help that the country provided them in the second part of the 20th century when they've been experiencing a really tough time with food and everything so you know when we i come to india and they ask where i'm from you say russia they like smile widely and say a couple of words in russia because they kind of have this warm nice feeling towards so we were thinking with my business, apparently uh, nobody was interested to work with us in the Western world because of the sanctions and uh, my business is strategic marketing consultancy in Russia. And we work with private sector. We don't yet work with government, even though 90% of the economy is government related. But anyway, so um, Western world was closed for us and uh, we thought, why not India? And then I came to India again at some point in time, I think it was my seventh visit there. And I, I think I was like either high or in something, uh, probably just weed or hash that we spoke with friends. And then I, I had this epiphany that, you know, there is this um, awful thing that was like came to like my knowledge is that it's called the feminicide, if I remember correctly. So basically, whenever um, a, a couple has a child and whenever they know that the child's sex is female, they make an abortion okay wow. or if a child is born and she's a girl they kill her so to me it was awful and i wanted to do something about it like literally do something about it so i i thought that you know we could try and use our knowledge and our collective experience to come up with a project that would you know change lives of women in india for better so we started to dig further and we quickly soon realized that in india they've outlawed uh, ultrasound for uh, pregnant women because of like this particular reason actually mm -hmm. but uh we quickly realized that there is another uh, big problem and it's called menstrual hygiene and the topic of menstruation in the first place which is a taboo in the majority of societies all over the world not only india so women in india suffer a lot so first of all the penetration of pads is like 14 percent on the, the total uh market level but uh, the stigma around the topic is so big that you know whenever a woman is menstruating a father of the household would refuse to use the toilet and then they have the menstrual huts in some regions where they send uh, women to menstruate there and then they're being raped Mm -hmm. and uh, you know get impregnated and all all the awful consequences so you know i started to think like what can i do you know about it i mean i don't have money i don't have anything that i can change the world but i had this thought unfortunately didn't realize but i'm still working on it so i came up with a project that would help through education alleviate the stigma and um, with my team with the researchers and the sociologists and my team uh, we dug deeper and we uh, realized that what we could do is offer like an approach to do a an educational intervention about uh, like basic physiology or you know health for uh, adolescents of age of seven to nine and the reason being is that the first of all there is no period yet there is no stigma yet there is no taboo yet uh, but it also is important to address men in the room because men are the problem and uh, it's a patriarchal society as uh, many others so we thought that we need to teach both women and men but how to when their children are more susceptible to new knowledge basically so uh we got the project uh we i think we need maybe like fifteen thousand dollars to just start in several schools in india we counted all we just don't have money so we called it Shakti. i called it's actually my wife called it 
and uh, then um, uh, spoke to many people and you know a lot of people are willing to help and it's just not moving but i had this epiphany that you know if i make it happen uh, within the, the previous year and the previous year i was uh, india's like chairing g20 and i thought that you know if i somehow get to narendra modi and narendra modi is the prime minister of india he's like very widely um like supported person in india and you know just a lot of indians are proud although not all but still so anyway if i get to him and tell him that look man i mean it's g20 this is the moment when you can really launch this project right. and show to the entire world that you are leading the change as gandhi you know yeah. promised at some point in time and indeed empower women because if you understand like the deeper roots of problems is that you know if women were to have an equal participation in the economy for India, for instance, they would have like quadrupled their GDP pretty much in three years. And this is insane. Right. And, you know, people and women use like dirty cloths to uh, cover the blood from the menstruation. This is ridiculous. So here as well, psychedelics could help. Uh, like weed, for instance, it has antiseptic qualities and it alleviates pain, uh, menstrual cramps as well. Yeah. So for me, it was just, you know, it, it resonated strongly. I wanted to do something. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to do this is that, um, well, I told you about my, my father, he left family quite young when i was like 12 and my mother she had like three jobs to you know put me on my knees with my feet and uh, then you know at some point i was like maybe four or five with like yeah, extra job here and there and i owe it all to her and if it wasn't for women i we wouldn't have all been here in the first place and i understand the lgbtq community and such but you know like still um so i thought that i could try and change something um haven't succeeded yet <laughs> i don't know man i think just having that epiphany and having the passion to do something yeah. you know, maybe 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 it hasn't succeeded at the level you want it to but to say it hasn't succeeded i don't think it's a fair statement man the fact that you're here telling me about it man oh, yeah. hear about it i think is success in itself and i'm thankful that you're doing it man thank you for that it's awesome yeah. thanks thanks for listening <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully people that maybe check out this podcast can reach out to you and. Yeah, that'd be nice. Oh yeah, the fine. Sorry, yeah, just the, there's one bit to yeah, that please. story. Well, so yeah. first of all, uh, everything's on LinkedIn and my profile, and you can find it in my post is there, and I think you can find a post from May. But this is like mind blowing thing, man. I think yeah. it's like an exclusive here. So if you find a particular post on my LinkedIn feed from May last year when or, where I announced this particular project, mm -hmm. and it's called like Fanatics Project Dedicated to Women's Health. Okay. So when you copy the link to this particular post instead of women it says fanatics project dedicated to activity i, I let me yeah let me just wrap that up a yeah bit. yeah yeah so uh, the presentation that is attached to that post is called uh, fanatics project dedicated to women's health okay so the word women in the link when you copy the link to that particular post is being changed because it has word activity instead of women but the funny thing is that it makes no sense word activity has more letters in it than women what so i mean if you can like literally do it yeah. right now and i mean I, I can send you the link yeah. uh, just give me a second and the thing is that it amazes me the most and i think one of the reasons is that you know all the algorithms and the AI in general was written by like white men pretty much and i think they just you know thought ah, you know why not let's just <laughs> change something here and there nobody would notice <laughs> and there then it happened and i think it, it led to oh yeah it was 10 months ago so can i send it here to the chat yeah, if yeah if go if you go down to present on the bottom you should be able to share your screen and we can do it oh live. yeah sure yeah let's do it live i mean yeah, because right? this is uh, this is like ridiculous i mean i i, I just don't believe it let, let me try and present it's, it sounds like maybe it's being filtered through the lens of that country censors or something like that like i don't I, like why would the algorithm do it unless it was something that was am i sharing my screen right now yeah yeah we can see it okay cool so uh if i click here so this is the post right and it says overview of an project dedicated women right okay i can see it right there 
Okay, yep. so what am I doing here? I'm going here and copy link to post. Okay. Okay. And then I input it here. Fanatics Project to activity. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, seriously. I, I mean, like, literally, women has five letters. Activity mm -hmm. has, like, what was it? Eight? Like, how come? If there was a similar post, it, is it possible uh, that no, maybe... it's not like, possible. It's <laughs> I mean, this is the name of the company, like, okay. seriously. Okay. <sighs> I don't know. LinkedIn, we're doing this live on LinkedIn. Maybe you guys can help us out, man. What's yeah. going on there? I don't get I, it. I, I, yeah, yeah that, that, that person, Reed, I think he's here, right? It's Reed Hoffman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is Reg's investor. He, he was, like, the owner or, like, founder of LinkedIn. Who was he? Like... I, I yeah, tagged him, founder. board member. He it, it didn't react. Maybe now is the time that he could uh, only three thousand three hundred impressions. But yeah. like, you, you've seen it. Yeah, interesting. I, like I, it's definitely algorithmic, right? S someone is changing that. I don't know. Is it the algorithm or is it is it because it's offensive to some men in India? You know, I don't know, man. Like, I, uh, but I, I did it, but I, I didn't uh, make this. I think I was making this post while I was in Lithuania. Okay. So it has nothing to do with India by ah. default. You know, it wouldn't. I think it's me. universal. I, I, it's it's universal? not. I, I, I hope. I mean, it's not. I hope so. I think I'm positive because I mean, you know, there is no like other explanation to it. It's just probably somewhere somebody at some point in time, you know, had a bias <laughs> yeah the, there's what i think it's hamlin's razor that says don't attribute to malice what could be attributed to unconfidence <laughs> yeah could be could be as well I, I just don't understand the logic behind it because there right. is some right it's an algorithm after all yeah, i mean there is course. certainly it's like either or like yes no and you know what is the criteria there <laughs> yeah yeah so ever yeah. since i noticed that i'm trying to <clears throat> even uh uh, further highlight the role of women and especially in psychedelics area and field as well because well i, I told <clears throat> about uh valentina gherkin for instance but there there was another lady and she's not widely known and actually um there there's a nice suggestion that what we could do is uh, yeah. to celebrate a day of a trip sitter so uh everybody knows albert hoffman right mm -hmm. i mean the father of lsd created it and you know blah blah blah, blah but you know well, when did it trip? Like the first conscious trip, it was April 19th 19? at 4.20, right? Like exactly 4.20 because it was logged in his journal. So it's not like a widely known fact, but actually if you dig deeper and you read the book and you find the evidence, you would see that he wasn't tripping by himself. He had a trip sitter and that trip sitter's name is was Susie Rammstein. Okay, so she was a lab assistant and she was with him on that day on riding along on another bicycle to his house, taking care after his, you know, high as fuck ass while he was on first uh, ridden acid trip and taking care of his needs and calling the doctor and calling other people and making sure that he was fine. So she was the first uh, trip sitter on record in the Western world. Moreover, she had her own moment in uh, June. Damn, I, I forgot. It's all, also posted on my uh, LinkedIn and Theogenic Renaissance um, about it. Uh, yeah, I found it. So, yeah, 12th of June, 1943. She was the first woman who had acid trip uh, because, again, she logged it and she had a nice tram ride. So I, I actually suggest that, you know, if there is an, a day that is celebrating a trip sitter, it should be June 12th. I love it, man. The June twelfth trip sitter day it should definitely be that. Like, people should adopt that in, especially here in Denver or in Oregon or in all these places, man. And honor women. Yeah, without a doubt, man. Without a doubt, there's a group, um, women in psychedelics that would. I'll put you in touch with them. Like they're super awesome, and they're lawyers, attorneys. Like that should be. This should definitely be a holiday. Uh, just send them my post on the Intheogenic Renaissance is there because I, I think you, you should do it. I mean, like, seriously, uh, with all the legacy, with all the discrimination, yep. with all the, like, um, inequality, I mean, still the world is run by white men in the majority of cases, right? So we need to do something about it. <laughs>
<laughs> because I, I think I have this theory and yeah, oh, I remember uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do the project in India in the, to, you know, change the, the like opportunities or en enable women to, you know, uh, empower them and change their life in the first place. And is that I had this feeling is that when, you know, uh, a woman in power, like say a president or a premier minister or something like that, she wouldn't have started a war. I, I I I would disagree. I think that people at the height of power are pretty Do you know? Psychopaths. Do you know like, any women who study wars? Um Well, I don't think it's fair to say that one in There weren't many women a war. in like, the first think, place. True, true, but I, I I think like I'll use I'll use our president for example. Like I don't think it's Joe Biden pulling the strings. I, I think that there is a group of people that facilitate the decision to go to war. I think putting it on mm. one person is too simple. Like, I, I don't think that one person decides mm, that. Could be, could be. But, you but know, I, when we're talking about authoritarian regimes. <laughs> would you consider companies authoritarian regimes? It depends. There's women CEOs that are complete psychopaths. There's a girl that runs UPS. She's a psychopath. And it, it's self-selected. I think True. power self-selects psychopaths. And it corrupts absolutely. It I would does. love to believe that women would be better leaders. But I think that the leadership position is is on some level like self-select psychopaths. And regardless of what type of generals you have, you're a psychopath if you want to be in that position. Like if, people who want to be yeah. in power should never be in power, man. <laughs> Ideally, yeah, that's true. No, that I agree fully. And you know, of course it's a theory. It's like well, my it's, thinking. There's a lot of truth theory. behind it, but it's com it's complex, man. It's like, not I, black I, and I white. Know. I, I yeah. get it. I get it. It's just, you know, uh, generally speaking, women are more like empathetic in the first place than, than men. And then you got to give it to them. It's like, I don't know whether it's nature, whether it's society, whether it's sure. culture, whether it's evolution, but still. But anyway, um, still the, something that we should tackle, yeah. you know, at least on yeah. 12th of June. <laughs> yes, I agree 100% with that. I, I think that the more women should definitely be celebrated and that we should be definitely. Susan deserves it. Yeah absolutely man we need all the heroes we can find right now we need to inspire all of the people we need to inspire relationships and absolutely. come together to like i think that's what the psychedelic experience is is that like we're all part of this thing man we're and i'm yeah. so tired of all the division like i it, it bothers me man it bothers me like we're i love all my sisters species. yeah yeah man Man. This, this is the reason that I created the, the company and registered one species because I mean, they, I, we're all one human being. Yes. I mean, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what color of skin? We all came from fucking Africa. Are you idiots? <laughs> like, seriously. Yeah. And I think that's what the psychedelic trip shows us, man. Like, you're part of maybe you didn't come into this world, maybe you came out of it. And I think mm. if people could begin to see that on some level, like, you, you are nature. Yeah, you know, part of it, you're the cosmos, we're yeah, particles, nothing, yeah. just a speck of dust, pretty much, yeah. just, you know, compiled in the shape of a persona that we perceive through our eyes. And what we perceive is not what reality is because it's just a construct within our brain. Yeah, yeah, it's so true, man. Uh, it's so funny. true. I, I think it speaks, all this conflict speaks to the idea of pain and suffering, and the mm. generational trauma. And maybe, maybe that's. You know, I, I don't have a real great answer for that. I know that I, when I, if I'm honest with myself, I think that I carry a lot of the pain that my parents had and the fear, more than more importantly, the fears my parents had. And that manifests yeah. itself in ways that are destructive to my relationships. And, but being aware of that is the first step in fixing it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? It's, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, but I, th there is uh, um, evidence from neuroscience which basically says that it, it, like it, this phrase totally makes sense. So once you realize that there are certain neural circuits that drive your behavior and they start to dissolve. <laughs> So that's what psychedelics do. They allow you to observe them. And that multi-generational trauma that you mentioned for, for me, it is like extremely uh, relatable because I went through that 
um, kind of therapeutic model that was created by Cybin. And I guess, you know, Cybin, they're like producing uh, like alterations of uh, psilocybin molecules. They're like kind of new agey pharmaceutical company, let's put it this way. So they got some therapists who are doing the clinical trials and stuff, and they created their own model. They called it Embark. I don't remember what it stands for like specifically, but I went through it. It's like open source online education for therapists. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And I, I remember there was this uh, woman, she was a black woman talking about, you know, multi-generational trauma, about the PTSD, what she called it, like, uh, uh, damn, I don't remember. It was like really nice, not like uh, traumatic, but like slave disorder, post-traumatic slave disorder or something like that. So she gave an example of, you know, like two women talking to their children in the same space and, you know, a white woman, you know, praising her child, saying that he's uh, like her, that wonderful kid and whatnot. Whereas the black woman would say to her child that, you know, that awful motherfucker is useless completely. And she was saying it's not because she didn't love him. She does. But she says that so because, you know, if she was asked like 200 years ago by the white master about her child, and if she were to say that he is, you know, this brave and strong, he would have been taken from her or sold to somebody. So, you know, it's just being given from generation to generation to generation and children are being and sitting there and basically getting this new trauma. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that, you know, in my background, actually, like Russian background and the communist regime and all the wars and all the bankruptcy and everything yep. that happened i mean there are so many layers of trauma i don't even like i mean when i realized the depth of like the multi-layeredness of that trauma cake i quickly like realized that it's just not gonna be resolved for like another hundred years because people don't believe in therapy in the majority of cases there and they don't address those issues and un unless you know they use psychedelics it's not going to happen because how do you get to multi-generational trauma with just talk therapy I, I find it hard to believe but with psychedelics you can because you have this contact with i don't know either like previous lives or the global subconscious or the understanding of all those traumas deep rooted in your like genes or somewhere deep in your psyche that you got from your mother's milk or something like that and you know the depth of that trauma is enormous and i don't see that anybody's addressing it anytime soon unfortunately so yeah, man, that's that's awful. But there's promise. That's brilliant, man. Thank you for sharing that. Like I I, I couldn't agree anymore. And and maybe this is why people have bad trips. Imagine yeah. imagine just compressing everything that your parents told you for the last five generations about how horrible you are, or carrying that trauma of abandonment for four generations. And then all of a sudden, in the depth of a psychedelic trip, you realize, oh, oh shit. Yeah. Like it, it hits you, man. You freak out a little bit, you know, and, and you should. That, that is the emotional release of a generation of trauma manifesting itself through you in an hour. <clears throat> Dude, of course you're going to do something. Like you're going to lose it a little bit. You're going to cry, start punching yeah. stuff maybe. Like I get it. But that, that's the release that people need to free them from the chains of the generations that have told them all these lies, man. Like, and, and that's that's called breaking the cycle. You know, people yeah. that have been in abusive relationships have all like I've seen men in my life treat the women in my life horrible. And when I had a realization, I went and confronted some people in my family. Like, do you guys see mm. what's happening here? This mm. is this is unacceptable. Everyone has treated you like shit. Every mm. one of them, and, and you have enabled it. And they look at me and go, You're the problem, George. Me, you know, yeah. I am I'm telling you what the problem is. And they're like, I didn't want to talk to you right now. You're out of your mind, George. And I'm like, here's the pattern. Look at it. Tell me why I'm wrong. And they're like, you're wrong because you're wrong because I said so. And it's like, th then then the next level is, well, how, how do you mm -hmm. integrate that? Like, You go tell the people you love about this pattern that, that you have seen disrupt their life and ruin their life and it's still doing it. And you bring it to them with all the courage. Like, fuck, I hate to tell you guys this, but this is what I see. And they're like, no, 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 you are the problem, George. Hold me. You know, it's it's then what do you do with it? How do you integrate that? Like, oh my yeah, God, man. people don't even want to be around me now because I, I pointed something out to them that that killed me forever. You know, it's 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 a trip, but but here's what I know: one person doing that hmm. can be enough to to inspire someone else to do it. Hmm. And that 
start that that's a new chain of reaction breaking interrupting that pattern in your life can make sure that it doesn't happen for the next generation and that is like exponential growth right there hmm. one person can create exponential growth for humanity by interrupting that one pattern in their life man <laughs> i i couldn't agree more man and i i think there's like just to build on top of what you've said uh, there is this the thing you know uh, you know i i, I always kind of annoy my wife oh, don't, yeah. don't drink i mean i mean this is good bad for you and you know don't smoke and that stuff but anyway um what i like realized at one point in my life is that uh, unless a person you know desires to change something about their life it, it is simply pointless to try and convince them to change something because as you said they will tell you that you're the problem <laughs> they, they don't have any problem they're doing totally fine yeah. so i i think what you're saying it, it totally makes sense because in, instead of like telling people what to do mm -hmm. you're showing them and leading by example yeah. pretty much and then get yeah. inspired they see oh it's possible so you yeah. can quit alcohol like using psychedelics yeah. or you can get i don't know rid of addiction or ptsd or trauma and you can live a better life seriously huh but if you tell them oh, go try psychedelics yeah. they're good for you they're like wow you're drug addict junkie you're like what's wrong with you <laughs> you know because I, this is like very intricate part and like yeah. I, I think it's very nuanced but I, I i really love that you say it because it resonates strongly it's alcohol is an interesting one because if oh, you yeah. look at like aa i think it was bill wilson who who actually incorporated lsd into the 12-step program he tried but to I, they, they right? didn't let him because uh, it was the, the substance and they were against it they said it compromises the politics of like the the, the the charter or whatnot but he had the belladonna experience that uh, helped mm -hmm. him quit alcohol in the first place it was in 1934 so he went to the clinics in new york to get treated uh, from alcohol use disorder and they gave him belladonna and he had this room in the white light and ever since he never touched alcohol but he was psychedelic pretty much yeah but it's, sorry you have been trying no, to talk about the alcohol and the dangers of it and the aa so it's it, it's even to this day like sometimes when i'll talk to people who have battled addiction there seems mm. to be two camps one camp is like yeah I, i'm addicted i was addicted to alcohol but now i've taken these psychedelics and i'm no longer addicted to it but then there's mm. another camp that's like you can never ever touch another substance again but you can still have coffee or smoke cigarettes you know yeah right like, <laughs> <laughs> psychoactive substances pretty much but yeah, I I think well to me it's probably the first camp because I haven't yeah. had an alcohol since November last year. And yeah, yeah, just, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's not that I went through AA or anything. I just uh, basically did what the, like I'm supposed to be doing with the theogens is that I updated my software, so to speak, well and told myself that you know I'm I don't need it any longer, pretty much. So yeah. I don't really feel the need to go for a drink in the moment. Yeah, or, like yeah, when I see people drinking, I have no craving, which is really nice. But yeah. um, just what I wanted to say here is that it requires like self work, of course, and yep. concentration and you know the efforts to put into it. Because I remember like having thoughts that probably should drink, I uh, should quit drinking, but probably should do it sometime, and then you know just delaying it, delaying it, delaying it. But then uh, once it's done, it's definitely better. <laughs> but yeah. I, I don't really understand all those people from the second camp though about the other substances that. It does make sense, as you said. I mean, tobacco, sugar. I mean, yeah. Like, you know, for instance, in Arabic countries, uh, alcohol is prohibited. It's haram, and you cannot mm. really buy it or consume it. But they consume like tons of sugar, like tons. <laughs> and I, I would argue, maybe it's even worse. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting the relationships we have with things. I know when I was younger, I used to smoke or whatever, and. Mm. Like tobacco is a t or nicotine is a tough one to kick. Oh, but that's a tough one. That's for sure. It's tough, man. I but struggle with it from time to time. I mean, either either quit and start. For, I'm like, oh man, I I I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> but I'm struggling with it still. You know what helps is like I I grow or I grow like a tobacco plant and like mm. it's it's called Hopi tobacco. But sometimes I'll just chew those leaves. Like I don't I don't smoke anymore and I don't dip anymore. But I um, you know, sometimes I've I've changed my relationship with 
with tobacco on some level by growing that plant and then just chewing the leaves. Like I think it changes your relationship to that substance. And in doing mm. so, you know, it changes your relationship with it. Like it's, it just, it's occasional. Like, Oh, I'll chew some of that. It feels pretty good every now and then, but <laughs> yeah, just earlier today, my wife, she asked me to like uh, roll her uh, cigarette yeah. and I ran out of, because in Sri Lanka, I bought it back. And then I yeah. came back. It's like, I'm not smoking. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we went to the store and I rolled her, but I didn't. And I was like, whew, that's an achievement. <laughs> Yeah, it's but of course it requires more work. Yeah, it does. It does. It's it's interesting. The it, it's I don't know. Like, I, we as human beings, we addict. Like that's yeah. what we do on some level. Like that's our that's what we do. We find something we like and want to do it all the time and do it more. <laughs> the system is faulty. That's for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, Glad, yeah. I love this conversation. Man, it's so much fun. <laughs> I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, likewise, man thanks for you know offering this opportunity i, I it, it's real pleasure and i definitely learn from you and i, I think i will ask like how do you do it in the background so that i could do it as well because i want to bring people to like this type of conversations more and more to have you know the opportunity to speak with fellow psychonauts from all over the world yeah well you yeah, for, for everybody watching um vlad's got his own youtube channel in, th in theogenic renaissance and he does a lot of really cool work on there where he's discussing a lot of cool topics and if you're listening to this right now you should definitely i'll put all his links will be in the show notes but yeah i, I think Thanks, that man. the world would benefit from you doing some more interviews with people like i, I love your take on stuff and i think you're doing a cool <laughs> job there but if you can hey. mix in a few people that would you know bring more people into the tent man i, I think Absolutely. that you'd be doing the world a favor man i, I you know what appreciate we'll it. talk more after this but yeah like i I'm thankful to get to talk to you and I'm, I'm stoked for your time, man. Thank you. Oh, likewise. Thank you, my friend. It's a real pleasure. So but before I let you go, where can people find you? What do you have coming up and what are you excited about? Oh, where people can find me. So I think you can find me on Instagram. It's the other Russian. <laughs> so it's the underscore other underscore Russian, which is easier. Uh, unfortunately, on Twitter, it didn't work this way. They have a limitation. That, that's why on Twitter, I'm the other Russ. <laughs> <laughs> people may may think that i'm a russian spy and you know conceal it um what else but telegrams in russian so yeah i think like either insta or twitter uh, but linkedin is the most uh, used social network by me and then I only recently when i became a blogger i started to use other social networks before it was just linkedin linkedin is more professional <laughs> but yeah. um what were other questions sorry i'm just um, sleepy so, here that's all right it's late over there man yeah uh, it's 11 p.m um so the first one was where can people find you the second right. one is what do you have coming up and the third one is what are you excited about coming up who like what like uh ideas or yeah well i mean um obviously you got the youtube channel coming up yeah um, is there is there any events that you're working on for the india project that you have coming up where people can reach you for that particular area or yeah, so for India, it's definitely better to get in touch with me on LinkedIn because there is a lot of uh, information about the project. I'm currently working on building brand strategy for an open foundation. It is um, a nonprofit from Netherlands so who is uh, organizing the biggest conference on psychedelics in Europe and probably in the world. It's called ICPR. So you can find me there. It's happening between June 5th and 8th in Harlem, Netherlands. Um, other than that, man, I'm just trying to make my blog work and, you know, get rid of my other work duties. Yeah, <laughs> I want to talk you. about psychedelics and <laughs> preach about the therapeutic potential. Uh, the third one, excited or what was it different? Yeah. What are you excited about? Dude, I mean, I'm extremely excited by the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. I'm, I just, I cannot, I mean, whenever I meet a person, I think like literally first or second phrase is just, have you heard that LSD can treat PTSD and depression? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my wife is pissed because I mean, yeah. she asks me not to talk about it <laughs> because I talk too much about it at home. But yeah, that's the topic that uh, fascinates me still, like every day uh, for the duration of I don't know how many years. That's insane. I strongly believe that they have insane therapeutic potential, but of course, safety measures are required as always. 
Oh, yeah. Fascinating. All right. Well, hang on briefly afterwards. I'll talk to you just briefly afterwards. But ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as we did. Go down to the show notes. Check out Vlad. He's got a lot of projects going on. He's really fun to talk to. Reach out to him if you're interested in anything he's doing. I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. And that's all we got for today. Aloha. Thank you, brother.